Hello, this is Keith Kaiser with another lesson from God's Word in Luke's Life of Christ. Today we're in Luke chapter 6, and we're continuing on expositing this message of the Lord Jesus Christ that many have called the Sermon on the Plain. And we'll begin our reading at verse number 36, Luke 6 and 36. Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. And the Lord Jesus here is pronouncing against a censorious sort of spirit, a judgmental attitude that is forever finding fault with others. And as we'll go on to see with his further teaching in this passage, that overlooks one's own faults and majors on others' problems. Uh, that is not something that the Lord wants Christians to do. However, nowadays it's been said that uh, Matthew 7, 1, which says, Judge not, lest ye be judged. And we have a very similar verse here in 637 of Luke. Judge not, and you shall not be judged, it begins. Uh, these verses have supplanted John 3.16 as the best-known verses in the world. Uh, that's what someone says, sort of tongue-in-cheek. Because often you get people that aren't believers that say, well, doesn't the Bible say judge not? Therefore, you can't call my lifestyle evil, or you can't say what I'm doing is wrong. And the Lord Jesus clearly wasn't saying that, because you only have to read the Gospels, only a few pages will do the trick to see the Lord Jesus condemning all sorts of sin. In fact, calling on people that were judgmental in the negative sense, people of that censorious spirit, teaching against that was itself a judgment. So the Lord wasn't here issuing a self-negating principle. There's obviously a right and a wrong way to judge. There are things we ought to judge and things we ought not to judge. So first of all, what are we not to judge? Well, as I've said, Others' attitudes and motivations are very hard to judge, and it can be very easy to come down hard on other people and say, well, I would never do that. I would never fall into that sin that this person is doing. And yet we don't know uh, what our problem is. We don't know how deep sin goes in our lives, if that's our attitude, because 1 Corinthians ten twelve tells us, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And so we all have to be aware that we have a fifth column within. We have that traitor inside of us, even our flesh, that principle of sin at work in our bodies, in our members, as the Bible says, that is working against us to make us fall. That's why we never outgrow our need for the grace of God and our need for dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, by the power of his Holy Spirit. It is only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that we can overcome. And so we must be very careful in looking at others that we don't pronounce judgments on things that we're really not qualified to judge. Now, when we talk about people's actions, if an action is overtly sinful, according to the word of God, uh, that we do judge. We're called upon all the time to judge evil. The Ten Commandments are God's repudiation of certain behaviors that we would recognize, even irreligious people would recognize, that murder is wrong. So when the Bible says, do not kill, or do not commit adultery, or do not steal, or do not lie, uh, we would generally agree in society that those are things we ought to judge. So when the Bible is pronouncing against sin or wrong actions, or even wrong attitudes that are exemplified by our words, uh, we have no problem comparing that to the Word of God and judging it. Now, what's something else that we are not to judge? Well, in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul would say, judge nothing before the time. In other words, even when it comes to our Christian service, we can't sit back and say, now I know the final assessment of what my service is worth and what it's accomplished. None of us are going to know that 
until the judgment seat of Christ. Even if we're a believer in Christ, the final assessment comes from our Lord. None of us can say, well, I know I'm going to get praise and commendation, and the Lord's going to say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We ought to strive for that. We ought to pray that that is the sort of life and service that we live before God. But we can't say infallibly that that's going to occur or what a level of reward we're going to get or anything like that. Paul said in that sense he didn't judge his himself. And so it was a light thing to him, he said, if he be judged with man's judgment. In other words, others were passing judgment on his apostleship, on his service for the Lord. And he said, well, I can leave that to the Lord because at the end of the day, the Lord is the judge. The Lord is the one who's going to decide my level of faithfulness and what I've done and what it's really worth to him in his work. What is something else we are to judge? The next chapter in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5, tells the church there that they were rebuked by the apostle for not judging a man who was living in open and flagrant sin. He was living in adultery right in the midst of the church. And they were sort of saying, oh, well, we're a loving church, we're a tolerant church, perhaps something along that order seems to be what their thinking was. And they weren't dealing with the situation. And and this man refused to repent or abandon his sinful behavior. And so they were to put this man out under discipline. Again, well, in 1 Corinthians 11, we read that if we judged ourselves, then we should not be judged. In other words, there's that self-examination how is my walk with the Lord? Am I living under the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ? Am I obeying him? Am I following his word? Are the things in my life that I've let creep in that are disagreeable to him, that are robbing him of glory or impeding my progress in the Christian life? Am I not being as useful as I might be to the Lord because I've let things come in? So you see there are times when we ought to judge sin and evil and even our own selves, how are we doing with the Lord? And there are other times where we ought not to judge. I can look externally at some other Christian, look at how they're dressed, uh, look at what they, uh, what they do, and I might be very critical of them, but I might not have any idea what that brother or sister goes through in their daily life. And sometimes people think, you know, this person shows up to meeting and, and they're dressed, you know, not so nicely or whatever. And that inherently reflects a disrespect of the Lord. Well, indeed, as Shakespeare said, the clothes oft make the man in Hamlet. And um, it, it can be sort of a lackadaisical attitude where we just show, ah, I'm not too serious about the things of God or I'm not too serious about what I do. On the other hand, you can have somebody show up that's immaculately dressed, and yet in their heart and mind, they're a thousand miles away from God and his things at that moment. They're living a double life, maybe, or they're not very close to the Lord. They're not walking closely with him by reading his word and praying. Or you might find that person that comes in with the older clothes, you know, that really this is the best they have, or that the circumstances warranted them coming to meeting that way because they had to come straight from work or they're on a trip or whatever. And it, it's good to not form those external judgments based on the outward appearance because as Samuel the prophet learned in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, man looketh upon the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. And James too would warn us about showing respective persons. In other words, that kind of favoritism that looks at the economically poor and minimizes their worth to God and looks at the economically rich and maximizes their worth to God. And sometimes it's the poor that is the most faithful, the most spiritual brother or sister. Sometimes it's the rich uh, that actually impede the gospel or hinder the work of God. And of course, there are plenty of spiritually rich uh, people that are spiritual who are economically rich or people that are poor who are not very spiritual. So you can find examples on both sides. We can't generalize and specifically not by outward appearance. James came down on the Christians in James 2 for taking the poor man and giving him a terrible seat by someone's footstool and fawning over the rich man in the public gathering. Now, going on, we see that there to 
Condemn not, and you shall not condemn. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, uh, will be put in your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So this is kind of the sowing and reaping principle. Uh, I don't fully understand the agricultural metaphor here from the ancient world, but apparently they would go forth with aprons on that had seed in the front of that garment. And if you went out with a lot of seed and planted and spread that seed abroad, you broadcast it, then that would bring in uh, a great crop, a great harvest that would come back. So it's sort of like you get what you put into it. And people might say, well, if I'm forgiving and if I'm not condemning and if I'm not judging, then surely people will walk all over me. And the Lord says, no, the thing here is to show mercy and that we will receive mercy in turn, to show forgiveness and we will receive forgiveness in turn. And again, we're talking about that, the practical effects in the Christian life, that if we don't exhibit these things, we will be disciplined and chastened by the Lord. Now we go on and he talks about another parable there in verse 39 when he says, can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Now these parables are rather graphic and obvious in that it doesn't take uh, much f figuring out to understand what the Lord's saying. A blind man comes along and says to another blind man, oh, I'll show you the way. And if neither of them can see, uh, of course, it would be very easy for them to fall into the ditch. And unfortunately, when we come to spiritual things, there's a great many blind people out there who say to show others the way, who say, I can show you the way to heaven. And yet they don't know the way themselves because they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And eternal life is very simple. You've got to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus. You have to receive him by faith. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life, says First John chapter 5. And so do we have a relationship with the Lord? If we don't know the Lord, how can we lead anyone else in the right way? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by him. Now, there are also people that even within Christian circles will say, well, I can tell you what's wrong with you. I can give you good advice on your problem. You've got a splinter, a little speck in your eye. Let me take it out for you. And yet there's a two by four protruding out of their eye. Now that is not the sort of ophthalmologic surgeon that I would want tackling my eye. I've had eye surgery and you want someone who sees well and who has steady hands and who approaches the task very carefully, even to remove something very tiny out of your eye. And the absurdity of someone with a massive plank sticking out of their eye, trying to come and remove a splinter from somebody else's eye, you say, well, that's just ludicrous. This person is a fool for trying it. Worse still, the Lord calls them a hypocrite because they're playing a role. It's a word from the Greek stage originally, and it's wearing a mask. It's playing another role. You're pretending to be something you're not. So you pretend to be a leader and a spiritual guide of others, and yet you end up doing more harm than good because you can't see clearly. Uh, that's something that we could all fall prey to and that we need to be wary of. It's better to seek wisdom from the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it's not the haughty person that gains that wisdom. It is the person that sits at the feet of the Lord and learns of him. That's where we uh, get the credentials. That's why when Galatians 6 talks about, Brothers, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of fear, considering yourself, lest ye also be tempted. See, the person who's going to do the restoration, the setting of the broken bone, is the Greek word used there, 
that person needs again to be aware of their own uh, shortcomings, their own fallibility, their own uh, fact that they could fall into the same thing very, very easily. And they have to approach this correction with humility, realizing there but for the grace of God go I. And so you come carefully and you come lowly. In the example of our Lord washing the disciples' feet, he had to stoop down and gird himself like a slave to do that job. And so do we. And so it's very important how we approach this job of correcting someone else, not doing it in a judgmental, censorious spirit, not doing it with an unforgiving and condemning mind, not doing it with being unaware of the major glaring sins in our own life that we haven't dealt with. No, it's, it's not saying don't correct somebody. There is very much a need for correcting one another, for rebuking one another sometimes, for certainly exhorting one another and encouraging one another. We need to do these things, but we need to attend to our own spiritual life first. So may God help us to do that. Thank you for listening.